All right, we are continuing in the book of John today, chapter 3. If you'd like a physical Bible, the ushers are back there with Bibles. You can raise your hand. If you don't have a Bible, you can actually keep this Bible. We'd love to gift it to you. So we're in the book of John, chapter 3, verses 22 to 36. After this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing at Anon near Salem because there was plenty of water and people were coming and being baptized. This was before John was put in prison. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. To this, John replied, a person can receive only what is given them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. He must become greater. I must become less. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. Whoever has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the spirit without limit. The father loves the son and has placed everything in his hands. Whoever believes in the son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. Amen. All right. Hey, well, what a fun Sunday. Uh, can we thank the teams for getting up a little bit earlier than what's normal, what has been normal? Also, I need to get back some table real estate, so <laughs> notice that I'm throwing it to the closer rows. <laughs> I can throw it that far. No, um, I'm not even going to try to throw this. We'll, yeah, leave this over here. Uh, hey, it's good to be with you. I also want to give a shout out to some of the youth that I know are here today. Uh, it's fun to have you guys, current youth. Man, I was telling uh, my son just yesterday, Caleb, that when I was his age, uh, I got to start attending, I don't know what we're calling these in relation, like big service, uh, adult, adult gathering, whatever. Uh, and I would say that perhaps more than just about anything else, I mean, it's way up there for me. Uh, being able to attend this gathering as well as the youth gathering afterwards had such a big impact on my faith. So we're excited to have them out. The team is awesome, Eric, Ellen, and everybody else. We thank God for you guys. I'm also excited for those of you who are on the kids team that you're actually here with us right now, even as you're going to be serving next gathering with the kids. That's exciting. Thank you, kids. And then last but not least, if you're new, you got a postcard or, you know, a friend, an invitation from a friend. In many ways, we, today is about you because we want to make room for more people to join us in community as we're trying our best to follow Jesus together. So, so welcome. Uh, let me say a prayer and then we'll jump into today's teaching. Father, today really does mark uh, a meaningful uh, point in the life of the church. And we just want to stop and reflect on your goodness. We are here today because of you, and we pray that you would, from this point on, continue to do good things and even greater things, not for our sakes, but for the sake of your glory, for the sake of you pushing forward your gospel, your good news in the Silicon Valley and beyond. What a, what a wonderful thing you've been doing. Thank you for letting us be a part of it in a small way. Please bless our times together in these separate time gatherings, but one church, and please give us your spirit now as we turn to your word. Would you show us what you have for each of us? We ask in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Well, the comparison trap is very real, and it's very easy to fall into. We're, we can very easily fall into the comparison trap. Uh, the reality is comparing ourselves to others is a very natural thing for all of us to do. 
And it's not all bad, right? In in many ways, when we compare ourselves to others, it's kind of helping us define who we are, what we're about. It helps us understand, you know, the unique things that we bring to the table. But it's now well documented that if we're just constantly comparing ourselves to others, we're really setting ourselves up for feelings like discouragement, you know, anxiety, even depression, And it's not hard to understand why, because if we're constantly comparing ourselves to others, we're constantly setting ourselves up to fall short. Because there's always going to be somebody who's better at X, Y, or Z. There's always going to be somebody who has more. There's always going to be somebody who's better looking or whatever, fill in the blank. And we live in a time where that's on hyperdrive because of social media. Now, social media is not all bad, of course, but the, the fact of the matter is social media really magnifies all these things. And I think about the youth as you guys are attending this gathering. I mean, when it comes to the comparison trap, the temptations of comparing ourselves to others the, and, and, the, and the effects that comparing ourselves to others, it's actually most documented of all that that's a, affecting teenagers. So this is something you guys have got to be thinking about as you guys are developing and working out your faith. But it, it affects all of us. And, and, the, and the reality is, The comparison trap isn't something that's only been around in modern times. It's been around as long as people have been people. The comparison trap was actually there in the scriptures. And it was actually something that John the Baptist, our focus today, uh, faced himself and yet so refreshingly, so amazingly wasn't sucked into it. I love John the Baptist, particularly with this text, because here's an, uh, an example of something good. So often when we study the scriptures, unless you're looking at the life of Jesus, you know, the sinless, perfect son of God, unless you're looking at him, so often we're looking at the scriptures to learn from people in terms of what not to do. But here we have a wonderful case study of a good example set by John the Baptist. What a mature follower of Christ can kind of hold as they face the comparison trap. And so I want to focus in on it today. What what does it look like? I want to look at this timeless wisdom, these principles that John the Baptist gives each and every one of us to consider as we think about the comparison trap in our lives, which is often just at work when we don't even realize it. And I just want to say, if you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus, you're checking things out, checking out his Christ's claims, I think you chose a good day to come too because to me, the timeless truths and principles that John gives us can help us wherever we're at on our spiritual journey, but especially for the Christ followers, some some really incredible uh, wisdom here. Uh, So that's what we're going to get into today. Let let me set the scene. So John chapter 3, the end of John chapter 3, we find that Jesus' ministry has really begun to take off. Okay, if you've been with us as we started going through the book of John, here now in John chapter 3, things are taking off. The crowds are interested in him. They're coming to him for for the authoritative teaching they're hearing that he has. They're coming to him for the miraculous healings that they heard he's about. And so Jesus had been spending time in more of the urban area or Jerusalem. Now we're told by John the writer, incidentally, not to be confused with John the Baptist. John the writer tells us that Jesus is now moving into the countryside, the Judean countryside, and he's out baptizing at the Jordan River. Actually, technically speaking, John the writer will help us understand that it wasn't Jesus personally baptizing. He'll tell us in a few verses, come next week that it was actually Jesus' disciples who were doing the baptizing. But regardless, John the Baptist's disciples, his followers, get really worked up about this. Because they had been out on the Jordan River doing their thing, baptizing people, people coming to them for spiritual guidance. And all all, along comes Jesus and his followers. They're baptizing. And uh uh-oh, people are starting to go over there. So you start to see the scene. And Uh, You can hear just the concern in their words as I read them back to you. They came to John, his followers, and said, Rabbi, as a spiritual teacher, Rabbi, that man on the other side of the Jordan, they couldn't even bring themselves to say Jesus' name, the one you testified about, look, he is baptizing and everyone's going to him. They're worried, right? It's not hard to understand why. They're worried because they had been the big game in town. Everybody had been coming to them, but now, uh uh-oh, they're going to that guy. John, what should we do? How are you feeling about this? Imagine if you were in John the Baptist's shoes, like, or Birkenstocks. What would you have been feeling, right? Put yourself in his Birkenstocks. How would you you be feeling? How might you respond to these worried disciples of yours, right? And if you might be thinking, well, yeah, he sees what he needs to see, and I'd see that too. 
let's contemporize this for a second. Imagine you are killing it in the nonprofit world. You start up an organization that's having tremendous impact in people's lives, in society. You're garnering, garnering favorable opinion. You've got momentum and all the rest of it. And then along comes one day a group of other individuals who are essentially doing the same thing in the same field as you. And all of a sudden, everybody's going to them. No longer going to you. People are looking to them for what they think. The press is going to them for their thoughts and, and all the rest. They're like, how, how would you be feeling? How would you respond in a situation like that? I don't know how it would have responded, but I, I imagine it wouldn't have been res- along the lines of John the Baptist. I'll tell you that. We've got a lot to learn from and unpack in terms of these principles for how we can avoid the comparison trap. It's so good. He says this in verse 27. He starts with this. A person can receive only what is given them from heaven. Uh, first principle for avoiding the comparison trap. The mature or maturing follower of Christ understands that all they have is a gift from the Lord. The mature or maturing follower of Jesus knows that all they have, and really all that they are, is only a gift from the Lord. And you know, this is an, incredible thing, it is an incredibly important thing for us in the Silicon Valley to let sink in. You know, because we, we live in, a, in an extremely talent-rich area, wouldn't you say? I mean, people are literally coming here to change the world and doing it. It's incredible. I love being able to live in this space and time uh, with many of you doing these very things. It's like, it's a very talent-rich, and a lot of hard work goes into that. A lot of thought and planning and strategy and entrepreneurial innovation and all, like, not to discount any of that, but at the end of the day... Really, we only, all of us, stand on the shoulders of people who've gone before us. For instance, at a very fundamental level, none of us decided to come into existence. You know, our parents brought us, they made made a decision. Or they didn't make a decision, and here we are anyways. Like, and we could either think, okay, it's, man, we're just random chance on an infinitesimally small, like, and we happen to be here, or, as we believe as followers of Jesus, that God very intentionally thought of us, knew us by name, brought us into the world. And it's like, we, life is a tremendous gift, no matter how you slice it. It's an incredible gift. Life, the air that fills our lungs. But even alongside things like life, the opportunities and privileges that we have. You know, when it comes to the comparison track, trap, say, in the workplace, it's easy to look at the person, you know, a couple desks down and go, man, they had all the privilege. They had all the opportunities. They were the one, you know, and start to go down that road. And hey, those, those are thoughts that need to be worked out, all that sort of thing. But even if you just think about us being born or the average Silicon Valley person doing these kind of things, being born at the time and space that they were born have had, you know, thousands and thousands of miles of privilege and opportunities ahead of people born at the exact same moment on a different side of the planet. And you, Life is a gift. The opportunity to privilege. We only stand on the shoulders of people before us. And for the Christ follower, all the more, we know that God has just given it to us. It's, it's to be stewarded. It's not ours. But when the comparison trap comes, and we don't even realize it's doing it, in our own hearts we go, oh yeah, I'm better than that, or oh, I'm not what they're able to do. We're already starting to miss the perspective that John was living from. He's like, everything. A person can only receive what is given them from heaven. You know, and so the comparison trap in in light of those things is really a moot. I've had a couple of near-death experiences now, unfortunately. (laughs) And um, times in which I I was kind of confronted with, oh boy, am I going to make it through this? You know, where I was confronted with my own mortality and alongside that, confronted with the preciousness of life. And I remember one near-death experience in particular changed me, just changed my life. Because after that, I was just like not sweating the small stuff. You know what I mean? Like, the, I mean, co- the comparison trap wasn't even on my radar after that. It was just like you, boasting of what I'm bringing to the table or thinking about what they have versus what I have. It's like I wasn't even on my radar because I was just happy to be alive. The little things just kind of didn't matter as much. You know what I mean? That near death experience changed my life for a week. Because after about a week or so, I completely forgot the perspective of life is a precious gift. And back I was into the comparison trap. Back I was into looking at my circumstances with, oh, oh, 
John here didn't have, need to have a near-death experience. And just like, everything's from, everything's a gift from the Lord. We just receive. It's a perspective. Are you living from that? Those of you who are followers of Jesus, do you, do you live from that perspective? Does it, does it infuse your mindset? That's the first principle that we see from John the Baptist. Second one we see here is the mature follower of Christ looks to use their position of influence to serve, to serve others. In other words, they're looking to lift up others, not themselves. They use their positions of influence to serve. And we see that just incredibly by John the Baptist here when he goes on in verse 28 to say, you yourselves, he's talking again to his worried disciples, can testify that I've, I've said, I'm not the Messiah, but I'm sent ahead of him. John was saying, he's, he was reaffirming his, his mission, his purpose. His mission was to point the way for people to see Jesus. He's the Messiah. I'm not the Messiah. He's been saying, we know that going back to chapter 1, if you guys were here at that time. He's, he's reiterating his, his purpose, his mission to say, I'm just trying to serve these people to see their need for him. Guys, you... That's what this is all about. Don't sweat that over here. This is what it's about. Lifting up others, helping others, serve, using our privilege, our influence, people coming to us, anybody and everybody who wants to come, I'm going to just point them to him anyways. John was out there baptizing. Baptizing was really a way for John to point people to their need for God. You know, it's his main thing that he was preaching out there in the, in the wilderness and along the Jordan River was repent and be baptized. Repent meaning confess your sins, acknowledge that you don't have it together before the Lord. You're sinful, to use a biblical term. And repent meaning turn from those. And baptism was a way of outwardly showing that, expressing that. It was, a, it was kind of a sign of like you've gone, you've, you've died to sin and you, you come up to new life in what God has made possible for you, which would ultimately be consummated in what Christ came to do as the Messiah, dying on the cross for the forgiveness of sins that we can receive by faith, eternal life in him, a renewed relationship with God forever. That's the gospel or literally the good news of Jesus. And John was saying, that's my mission. I'm just out here. Anybody who wants to come be baptized or talk about things, I'm just going to serve them, use my position in order to facilitate. That's all I've... That's all it's about, followers. And boy, wouldn't that change the world if we increasingly lived into that, if Christians increasingly lived into that. I'm not one for hyperbole, <laughs> but it would, it would change things. I mean, if you think about it on a smaller scale, if we as a community leaned into the calling of all Christians, not just John the Baptist, to look to the needs of others and serve, it would change things. Change the community, uh, this is what we're called to, and, and the, f the fact of the matter is it's not par for the course when it comes to our nature. I know, I know that's true of me, but we have, uh, Cindy and I have a friend, really dear friend of ours, who is just incredibly good at what she does. She's such a good worker, uh, such high capacity. She was recently uh, laid off at her high-level job, not, not for lack of capacity or her efforts or whatever, just because of, of budget cuts. But she is somebody where even in a sea of incredibly gifted people and workers, she is like up, way up there. That, that's the kind of gal this, this person is. And we had a chance to talk with her uh, more recently and intimately and just hear how she's doing and processing. And not that she really brought this up. We just kind of pulled it out. But she was talking about how in the midst of all of this, uh, it's, it's really moved her that over the years, different positions, people have sent her notes or, or emails or something, found a way to say something to her. Oh, man, I just so appreciated you as a boss. Like, you're just, you just the best boss. And she's just like, it just meant so much to her. And then specifically people saying things like, I'm so grateful for how you've shielded us as a team from all the corporate dysfunction we know you were dealing with on a regular basis. Yeah, we saw that. We know you were taking the brunt of that for us. And I just want to send a note and say thank you. And sending notes or finding ways to say to her, we're like, man, we, just, we always knew that you were for us. And it's like... I was really moved when she was sharing that because, one, again, this is somebody who's just high capacity, is out there able to take ground in whatever she puts her mind and hands to, and she's doing that wherever she is. And yet, while she does that, people on her teams are not only noticing that, they're noticing that to the degree of needing to feel like they have to tell her. You know what I'm saying? And I'm just like... That's an incredible example of what we're talking about here. Using our position of influence, not just to lift ourselves up, 
to lift others up, to serve them, care for them, help our teams, help our coworkers, help our... Another uh, example com- that comes to mind is, is my Cindy. You, we have a wonderful executive director here at the church. And I'm not just saying that because I'm married to her. Cindy is incredible. She's such a gift to this church, guys. And one of the most amazing things that she brings to the table is she is regularly working her tail off. She's incredibly gifted. Her tail off behind the scenes in ways that people will not ever see in order to help others accomplish and take ground. You know what I'm saying? Like she's, that's, that's her thing. It's incredible. It's like as her husband who sees, you know, only what I see, I'm just like, whoa. But it's not par for the course, these things like that. I don't include myself in that. And that's not to say this dear friend or Cindy herself or John the Baptist didn't actually struggle with the comparison trap. He actually would later on struggle with it himself. But the principle here of a mature following, uh, a Christ following individual is to use their position in order to serve, to lift up others. Is that true of you, Christian friends? That the positions of influence that you have, you are using for the sake of not building yourself up, lifting yourself up, but lifting up others to serve them? And if it's not true of you because you're like the rest of us, what would it look like for you to increasingly move into that direction? Celebrating people on your team. I mean, the, there's so many different ways you could think about it. But what does that mean for you in your vocation? What could that look like to use your position of influence to serve? Number three, the mature follower of Christ connects the dots of their lives so others see Christ. The mature follower of Christ connects the dots of their lives so that others can see Christ in them. Because what we see here is John wasn't just looking to serve others, lift others up, the people coming to him for baptism. He was ultimately, his primary aim was to lift up Christ. And he said that very famously in verse 30 when he said to his concerned disciples, he, Jesus, must become greater, I must become less. He, Jesus, must increase, another translation could put it, I must decrease. And it's not hard to see the logic John is following here, right? Because he's saying everything's from God, something to be stewarded. And if God has given us everything, not least of which he's given us his son as the Messiah, in serving others and in using this precious life that we've been entrusted, how can we not but point people to Jesus if we're followers of his? Is you tracking that logic? He must increase, I must decrease. And you know what struck me this week in my study for the first time? I've thought a lot about John the Baptist over the years. I mean, if you teach the Bible, he's, he's just there. He shows up. And it struck me for the first time that John was actually kind of a big deal in his day. He was the Ron Burgundy, those of you Anchorman fans. Kind of a big deal. Seriously, he had all the fame. Like, it, fortune wasn't his MO, right? He wasn't, he wasn't like Taylor Swift out there. But like, man, Josephus, the early first Roman historian, did a little section on John the Baptist. If there had been Wikipedia in his day, John would have had a big page. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying all this to say he was extremely successful. John had it going. So what we're not saying today as a mature follower of Christ is you just need to ditch all ambition. You need to just poo-poo success, downplay it spiritually. That's not what we're saying. We're saying go after these things as the Lord leads, calls you to, but do it in a way where you're grounded and humble. And Christ himself at one point said, yeah, be ambitious in, in more or less words. Just do it for the right things and with the right heart. That's what we're talking about here. How can you use your position to connect the dots for people to know Christ? He must increase, I must decrease. The reason John was able to do that is because he was laser focused on the goodness of Christ and Christ's mission for him. Are you doing that? Do you connect the dots for people to see Christ in your lives? You know, I, I bring, in my profession, you know, it's funny how I could be a pastor and miss this. Okay? That's an interesting thought. I'll let, you, let the meta kind of sink in there. I bring two verses that I have written in my, handwritten, they're also in there, written, written, uh, in my Bible, that I bring into the pulpit every week. One is, sir, we would see Jesus. That comes from a, an inscription that my dad had placed on his pulpit as he preached uh, for many years uh, in his context. And the idea there is pretty clear. It's like if you're going to preach a sermon, make sure you're talking about Jesus. 
You're helping people see Jesus. So I bring that into the pulpit every week. The other one is actually this verse right here. He must increase, I must decrease. And I don't bring that in the pulpit because I'm, I think I'm hot stuff and I need to keep myself humble. That's not why I, I, I don't personally struggle with that because I don't have any thoughts of grandeur here, okay? I bring this into the pulpit because I want in my preaching for him to increase and me to decrease. So say that at the end of the day, my prayer is not so much that you leave with, oh, wow, that was a cool story. Or, oh, wow, that was a funny joke. My hope and prayer is that you leave having seen Jesus a little bit more deeply. That, that's the goal. That's the aim. He must increase. I must decrease. And really, this is our heart as a church. We want to, as best we can, in and of ourselves, get out of the way and point people to Christ. That's what this is all about. Does your life, in whatever sphere of life might mean, in the vocational world, at home, whatever it is, do you connect the dots for people to Christ? Do you, do you help Increase him in your life and decrease yourself. Um, we just watched the Super Bowl. You know, I'm just thinking about the athletes who get the microphone and, hey, how is, tell me about that last play. And I just want to say all glory to God. And you, you've heard that before. And in some senses, I actually, you know, I've, I've, I've had mixed feelings about that. But overall, I'm like, man, that's pretty cool, actually, that they're doing that. Because they have this big platform. They're always on television. And that's their chance to go, hey, I just want you to know that. What I'm bringing to the table is I just feel like the Lord's brought me to this space, and I'm just grateful. I think Steph Curry is a great example of this because he's always having those after interviews, and he's not every week. I just want to say, you know, he doesn't, like, see it as his mission. Anytime anyone says anything, he's got to go, let me just tell you, you need to know Jesus. Or You know what I'm saying? But in the biggest of moments, Curry will do that. Hey, I just want to thank God right now. What would that look like in, for, for your context? Not every compliment you got to go, oh, I just... It's because of God. I mean, hey, maybe that's, hey, that, that would not be a necessarily bad thing just to say it. But just, you know what I'm saying? What would it look like for you in your context to connect the dots for people to Christ if you're a follower of his? Someone sends you an email. Man, I'm so grateful that as a boss, you've been my shield for all these years. I know there's all that dysfunction up the corporate ladder that you're dealing with. And I just, man, I just want to say thank you. Maybe you could respond saying, hey, that's really sweet of you to think about that. Hey, I just want to add that the reason I do that is because of my faith in Jesus. If there's anything I know he's done for me, it's that. So I'm just trying my best to do that. Appreciate you sharing that. Or when someone comes to you, he's like, man, that presentation I know you've been working on forever. You killed it. You're so amazing. He's like, man, I, yeah, hey, thanks for the encouragement. I thank God for the opportunity. But really, that's also just a, a factor of all the team helping me get to this place. Or someone comes to you, he's like, oh, man, you know, you're... You don't seem as worried about your, you know, being laid off as I thought you would be. He's like, yeah, well, hey, you know, I'd be lying to say if I wasn't nervous about finding my next job. But I've seen for myself God take care of me multiple times in ways like this before. I can, I'm trusting him. It'll work out. I'm not trying to prescribe how to do this. But in different ways, how could you connect the dots to lift Jesus up, increasing him that we might decrease? Because it seems to me that this is the ultimate way John shows us that we can avoid the comparison trap. Point people to Jesus, starting with ourselves. He must increase, I must decrease. I think it's the ultimate way. What am I saying? What do you mean, ultimate way to avoid the con comparison trap? John is just a faint shadow of what Christ ultimately came to do for you and me. You know what I'm saying? We're focusing here on John as this wonderful example. Oh, he's giving up. He's willing to give up the notoriety, the fame, people coming to him. Like, wow, those are big things. Those are our lives, although on a lower scale compared to John. That was a faint whisper of what Christ came to do for us. What did Christ do? He left his heavenly throne. All fame, glory, honor, and power. He left the angels singing his praises to come down and receive what from us? Rejection. And ultimately for us to yell the words, crucify him. And why did he do that? To lay down, in, in being lifted up, to lay down his life that we could have eternal life in him by faith. That's the gospel. That's the good news. Which means that when we, like John, look to have him increase in our lives, it doesn't mean we're ultimately decreasing. We're actually becoming all the more because we become, we're becoming the more in him. I mean, you think about what John was able to accomplish and what it's going to mean for him. Actually, let's lead to our last thought because this kind of connects into that. We see that the mature follower experiences a joy unlike anything else. 
He said again this to his worried disciples, the bride belongs to the bridegroom. Meaning the people who are coming to me, they belong to Jesus over there anyways. The friend who attends the bridegroom, attends to the bridegroom, waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and is now complete. So John is obviously using a metaphor of the wedding feast and being a friend of Jesus. In modern day terms, Jesus, uh, John was talking about himself as a best man at a wedding. And in those times, that meant that the, be the best men in those times handled all the details for the wedding. Like they planned the weddings. They planned the, the festivities. All of it fell on kind of the best man in that day. And nobody in those times would have been like, seems like a bum deal for the best man. Doing all the planning is really going to be about the couple. That stinks. You know what I mean? Nobody would have thought that way for all right reasons we know. That's what John's saying here. He's like, I, I'm like that. I get to be a part of, and I, so I have, I have with me joy. Here's the other thing that's just so incredible to take it one step deeper. John is saying words like, my joy is now complete. That almost, that seems to suggest that he is not unaware that he's probably going to be arrested in a few short time, in just a short while. Spoiler alert, he's arrested. And he's actually ultimately beheaded by Herod, we know from other texts. Almost certainly John knew something was brewing towards that end. And almost certainly he was referencing that when he says, my joy is complete. So get this. He spent his whole life in utter devotion following God and thinking about Jesus, Messiah to come, pointing everybody to him. Now he's on the precipice of probably being arrested or worse. Seeing people go over to him, not really be interested as much in him. And he says, my joy is complete. I have joy. Would you have joy in a moment like that? I wish I would. But that's what's available to the mature, maturing follower of Christ. A joy like unlike anything else because it's connected to Christ's goodness and his, and his mission. And it's no wonder to me that Jesus would go on to say of John, he was the greatest person born to humankind. Talk about high praise from the highest source. What does that tell us? John had joy because John knew God knew what he was about. God saw, Jesus saw, and for all eternity, just think about the joy that John the Baptist and Jesus our Savior are going to have and share together. Think about that. They're not going to be going, oh, it was a bum deal, you took my followers. I mean, it's laughable, but that's where we live. There's a joy available to us. Um, when I think about John the Baptist, uh, there, there's someone who inspires me more than just about anybody else in this regard, and that is my oldest sister, Karen. My oldest sister, Karen, is she went to a big, big high school, and yet she was voted prom queen, uh, student body president. She was high academic awards, all you name it. But early in her teenage years, she was also diagnosed with a rare eye condition called Stargard, which just means she has a black blotch in the center of her vision, so she has to look at you through her peripheral. You know what I mean? Like both, both eyes, she just can't see in the middle. And that's been growing over time. My parents were adamant, we got to help her. She's got to drive. So at 16, she was able to drive. It had progressed by the time she was 17, she could no longer drive. It's only been progressing since then. And she's incredible. She's, she's so Strong, you know, intellectually, but also e emotionally and socially. People love her. People turn to her. She's a natural-born leader. I've never heard her complain about her condition a single time. Not once. And actually, as my dad told the story, when she was first diagnosed in her early teenage years, he teared up at this because he understood her future and what that meant for her and his baby girl. And... Karen looked to my dad and said, Dad, it's going to be okay. If this is God's will for my life, it's good. Karen has devoted her life to pointing people to Jesus. She could, in a worldly sense, have gone up whatever ladder she wanted to. She could have done, she's now at the place where she actually just got, it's pretty cool, we're celebrating as a family, she just got a, a seeing eye dog, um, which is really special. Those are hard to get. Um, She's devoted her life to telling people about Jesus, serving others, caring for others. She's done that within the church context in numerous ways, formally, informally. She's done that in the non uh, She's doing that right now in the nonprofit sector. And there's been times where I'm out at the grocery store with Karen, and it's, it's incredible. We'll just be hanging out. 
you know, in the, in the line, and somebody will be like, oh, man, it's so hard. Everything's so hard in life or whatever. I remember one gal saying something to that. I forget the exact phrasing, but Karen said something like, yeah, things are hard, but God is good, and it's going to work out. And the person being like, huh, you know, and us walking away. And I'm sitting there thinking, and that person has no clue. She's like essentially blind. Talk about avoiding the comparison trap and thinking about things where you could just be upset with it. Why is that that way? And how come I couldn't do or whatever? She just has a joy. I want to think of John the Baptist in the Lord because she gets to serve the Lord. Care for Life is a gift. Anything that we have is an opportunity to serve others. Connect the dots to Jesus, and there is joy in the midst of that because this is only a faint whisper to all eternity with our Savior who was lifted up in order to lay down his life to lift you and me up in him. So what would that look like for you, for those of you who are followers of his, to lean into the model that John the Baptist sets before us? Let's pray.